Hello, and welcome to Legislative Report. I'm State Representative Kurt Mosser of the 107th District in Columbia, Montour, and Northumberland counties. Drug and alcohol abuse continues to be a problem of epidemic proportions in our region, and education and awareness are two vital keys to help address the problem. Everyone needs to be involved to take back our community and save our kids. With that goal in mind, I recently sponsored an event at Danville Middle School. The community was invited to hear the stories of those on the front lines of the war on drugs, as well as those who have struggled with addiction. On today's program, I'd like to share a small part of this presentation, beginning with Danville Police Chief Eric Gill. You know, as a parent, I trust my children, but I always want to make sure they're walking the straight and narrow line. As an example, you know, I do search bedrooms, I search cars, I read text messages, I want to know who they're talking to, I want to know who they're hanging around with, I know how much money they're carrying and where they're spending their money, and how I look at it as these are rights. These rights I have as a parent, and as long as these guys are living under my roof, I'm going to exercise my rights. I also, uh, you know, give my children hugs. This might seem kind of weird, but I also smell them to see whether or not they smell right. <laughs> not when they're out in the sun or anything like that, but I want to make sure they're not smoking or, you know, marijuana does have an odor to it and it does will stick in your clothes. So I make sure that they also smell good. And I don't think uh, as a parent that I'm, I'm kind of psycho for doing this. It's just that I've seen too many deaths, and unnecessary deaths over the years, and uh, these are a lot just not right. It's just not our society's screwed up. When you're communicating with your children, you find out that something may have gone wrong with them, like maybe they're starting to be depressed, or maybe they went from A grades to D grades or failing grades. Whether their friends have changed, whether or not they're hanging around with the people they should be hanging, or not maybe should be, or that we're hanging around with, maybe their group has changed. Those kinds of things are like flags that we need to be aware of, we need to be cognizant of, we need to understand that our children are our children and we have to be aware of how they're acting and, and going through life. What can we do to keep your kids off, or keep our kids off drugs? When it comes to you, that meaning parents, we may think that the influences are, you know, the crazy movies that we see, the songs that we listen to, or the friends they hang out with. There are some truths to what I just said, but surveys show that parents, parents are what guide our children. Parents are the most important influence. And when it comes to drugs, the parents are everything. In a 2002 survey by the National Center for Drug Addiction and Substance Abuse, they found that parents, though they had thought, parents thought in this 2002 survey that they had very little influence on their children and whether or not they used drugs. But in a later survey, they found out that half the teens who had not tried marijuana credited their parents for their decision. It's pretty substantial if you think about it. So how can you help find information on that we can use for our children? And there are two places, if you look online, one of them is the Partnership for a Drug-Free America, and the other is the White House Office of National Drug Control. I'd like to thank you for your time. I hope you take something from all the vendors that are out there. You learn something about the filth that's infiltrating our communities that used to be once in the cities, is now here, and it's affecting our, our young adults, our children, and we need to fight back and educate ourselves and teach our kids to say no. Thank you. Good evening. Um, it's a privilege for me to be here. Here I am and God has a plan. That's something I say a lot in recovery with people I work with. It's sometimes met with uh, not so happy a response. 
Some people don't like to hear that when you're going through something, but I'm telling you I'm here because God has a plan and I never would imagine that I would be here. Uh, the man standing before you today is a miracle. It's a miracle I'm alive and it's a miracle that uh, the things that have occurred in my la life in the last few years in recovery. And I'm not really an exception. There are lots of miracles in recovery of people who get clean. I'm only going to share briefly about my experience. Um, I started using around the age 13 or 14 years old, and I will validate what this man before me said, marijuana is a gateway drug. That is exactly what I started with in alcohol, and it led to many things that I had always told myself I would not do, but yet I did in my act of addiction. I figured this out, if I lived to be 78 years old, excuse me, 68 years old, I will be clean as long as I used. I, I stayed in active addiction straight through high school, through college, through a marriage, through people's deaths, through my children being born, through the end of a divorce. It took about everything that was of value to me in my life from me, and I will say in my act of addiction, I willingly allowed that to happen. And I could still not stop using. So the good news was, you know, at the end of the road, somebody was waiting to help me. You know, I bounced, you know, this is a 20 some year addiction. I bounced in and out of facilities. I rejected help when everybody around me was pleading for me to getting help and threatening me uh, to not have me in their life anymore. I've been in and out of institutions. I have been incarcerated. I have been arrested. And at the end of that journey, nobody was left to come see me. Nobody. But there was, however, an opportunity for me to participate in something called treatment court. And I wasn't sure what that was. And they said I had a hope and the possibility and support that I could get better. I wasn't sure I believe, even today, I'm not sure I believed them when they told me that. I had all but given up. I figured eventually I would die due to my addiction. I had lost pretty much everything in my life. But what that treatment court did is provide me a platform, which is kind of what you guys are doing here tonight. You know, they created awareness in me about what addiction is, how, how it has impacted my life, how I, I could get help, how I could change things. They, they love me, and, and, you know, I was a pretty unlovable person when I came in. I mean, I was a mess. But they provide, you know, people invested in my life, and that's what I'm talking about, love. They didn't know me. If you looked at me on paper or my past, I, I really wasn't worth much to uh, be putting effort into. But yet people reached out and put a lot of effort into my life and, and, and loved me. They provided the support I need. They provided, uh, you know, accountability. They provided counseling. They provided social services. They provided credit counseling. Um, you name it. Uh, there were people I could call if I needed to talk to about something. And that helped get me on this road, <clears throat> which I call recovery. It has been a long journey, but a pretty amazing journey. You know, going from hopelessness to having hope is pretty amazing. Going from destruction to restoration is pretty amazing. Going from having no self-confidence to being employable and uh, capable of being a father and again a husband um, and meet people's expectations and live up to responsibilities I commit to, like being here tonight, is pretty amazing because there were not so many years ago that was not going to happen if I told you I'd be here. So I am an advocate for treatment courts. There should be one in every town or county. Um, it worked for me. I've seen it work for many people. I would have never imagined when I stopped using substances that my life would anywhere resemble what it does today. And, and, and the truth is that 
you know, I'm not at a cap right now where I think it won't get any better. There's so many good things going on in my life. I'm continue to be amazed. Uh, my wife and I are planning a missionary trip to Haiti this fall. Um, you know, my belief is at some point I will be doing Christian counseling, counseling in some format of ministry down the road years from now. So I would, I would like to thank, genuinely thank you for this opportunity. I'd like to thank you for the fact that you showed up and that you are becoming aware. And uh, you know, we have to learn as much as we can about this and, and the impacts that it has in our society and in our communities and to our children. And we need to reach out to those around us that we think might be struggling. We need to use our intuition. If we think there's a problem, there, there probably is. And, and I'm grateful to be here. Thank you. I come from a good home. I grew up in Schmalkin. Uh, my mother was a school teacher. My dad owned his own business. Uh, had a had a great childhood, and um, I had plans on going to college and all that. Uh, <laughs> that's my daughter. <laughs> but uh, sometime in high school, uh, things started slowly to go downhill, and. Uh, I started off with drinking, which led to smoking weed, and um, you know every all the signs uh, I'm sure started coming. My grades started falling, uh, not listening, running away, uh, fights at home, um, you know, just completely being rebellious and. Um, All my dreams of college, uh, I played high school football and everything, it just all went downhill and, and ended. I, uh, I dropped out of high school and uh, from then on, my life became complete hell uh, and I didn't realize it. I, uh, I became a regular user of heroin uh, every day. I, I landed myself in jail this last time. An opportunity came about while I sat in there and I met a man, uh, his name's Rick Catino. And he came to see me the one day and uh, kind of told me about himself and I told him about myself and um, he, he ran a program uh, up in the Mount Carmel area and um, he said it was a six month program I remember him saying that. I was like no I'm not I'm not committing to no six months I'll sit here for another three months I'll probably be out and uh, I went back to my cell I remember and uh, I had a little bit of influence from my mom and my girlfriend too, I remember. But uh, I ended up deciding to take this program. My advice, I guess, for the parents would be don't hide it. Um, don't cover up for your kids. Don't enable them. Um, don't be giving them money. You know, if you need to put them in jail, put them in jail. Um, my mom put me in jail quite a few times. Thanks. <laughs> and that's all right, because it did help me. And, you know, if, if your son or daughter or loved, any loved one went to one rehab and they failed, you know, it doesn't mean their life's over. It doesn't mean they didn't get it and they're not going to. You know, every rehab I went to, I took a little bit from. Uh, every time I was in jail, I took a little bit from that. And it all adds up, I think. And it's, it's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life uh, to get clean and stay clean. Um, but uh, 
it's definitely worth it. I have, uh, I have two years, six months, and 17 days clean today. You've been watching a recent drug awareness seminar held at Danville Middle School. When we return, you'll hear from the keynote speaker who works in an addiction treatment facility. But first, I'd like to share the work of Danville senior Allison Willoughby, who prepared a sobering presentation on drug abuse in our community. The disease of addiction is unique in a lot of ways. When you have cancer, and you're told that you have cancer, you know you have cancer. With addiction, it convinces you, it's a disease that convinces you that you don't have it. It's a disease that makes you alienate and shun the people who would be there to help you the most. It's a disease that, you know, like you gentlemen had said, will make you unlikable and make people not want to help you at some point. And if you have people that are friends or family members of yours or just someone you know who is dealing with addiction, eventually it will reach a point where people begin writing them off. They've had chances. I've tried to help. They've, they've pushed me away. And one of the things we have to understand about that disease is at that moment when they are most unlikable, when, when they are hardest to help is the time when they need you the most. When you're ready to give up, that's the time you need to pick yourself up and extend your hand one more time because that's when you are most needed. 
Current evidence-based research, research tells us methamphetamine use, which started off as primarily a Pacific West Coast thing, is now all over. It's in our towns. Abuse of the tranquilizer Xanax in the muscle relaxant Soma has increased in this area and others. Ecstasy, which started off as just a club drug, is now in the streets. Crack cocaine, which always had a reputation for being used by um, African Americans of lower socioeconomic classes, is now more likely to be used by white or Hispanic people. Non-medical use of prescription drugs is now the biggest gateway drug for teens. According to a national household survey, abuse of prescription pain relievers is second only to marijuana use, as far as most widely abused substance. Ultimately, use of heroin by youths and young adults has increased exponentially. Outside of that, there's also something called Molly, which is a party drug, which is widely believed to be pure MDMA, which is the active ingredient in ecstasy. But long story and technical story short, it's a very dirty drug that's very dangerous and very much accessible now. There's also something out there called K2, or Spice, which is a synthetic marijuana. It's a psychoactive designer drug created by spraying natural herbs with synthetic chemicals, which has similar effects to that of marijuana. When the chief talked about smelling his children, just as a heads up, it's typically sprayed on potpourri. So if someone's using it, it's just going to smell like they've been walking through a Joanne's Fabrics. But it is an actual very dangerous drug. It's known to cause symptoms of acute and chronic psychotic disorders. Again, these are not the drugs that we hear Lou Reed writing songs about. It's new, but it's, you know, and it's not that well known, but it is out there. One of the newer and more disturbing um, effects of what I call the, uh, the Breaking Bad era. For those of you who don't know, Breaking Bad was a TV show that uh, was widely about uh, a teacher who made a living make, making methamphetamine. And amazingly, how after the popularity of that show spiked, so did production and circulation of methamphetamine. <clears throat> there is a substance out there called shake and bake, which is a new form of methamphetamine. Now, as opposed to the, the very scientific looking breaking bad type laboratories, it's a technique that requires using a two liter soda, bo two liter soda bottle a few handfuls of cold pills and some noxious chemicals. You shake the bottle, and the volatile reaction produces a cheaper, easier version of meth. Makes it very hard for law enforcement to keep up with, because you can make it anywhere. However, much like the dangers of a regular meth lab, the slightest wrong thing can make it explode in somebody's hand. It requires less pseudoephedrine than standard crystal meth. It's out there. How do I know? Because my brother was making it so that he could make money to buy heroin. It is scary, but again, educating ourselves and knowing what's out there is the first step. You know, when we talk about prevention, we have to know what we're trying to prevent. <clears throat> again, I'd like to thank you all. Um, it really is an honor to be here. And I would certainly encourage you to go out, see the vendors, ask questions, see what you can do to take part. By all means, if anyone's ever interested in coming up to Allenwood, taking a tour, asking questions, by all means, I would love to have you. Thank you very much. And you asked me, you might ask why the uh, interest from me in this subject. I come from a very large family. My mom was one of 12. I have hundreds of cousins, three brothers and two sisters, and numerous nieces. If someone would have came to me a year ago and said to me, name someone who, who in your family wouldn't get involved in the drug scene, I would have said my niece Erica. We buried Erica the day after Thanksgiving from a heroin overdose. Erica was a good girl from a very loving mother and family. She was a beautiful, caring, and giving. She made a horrible decision. 
The next shocker that came was when I got word on who was involved in Erica's death. I was shocked. It was two young men that I had known for years since they were kids. Good kids from good families who made life-changing horrible decisions. These boys were friends of my sons. These kids were in my house all the time until maybe a year ago when my son stopped hanging around with them. I didn't know why he stopped associating with them until it was too late. But the point is, this is what your current day drug dealers look like. It could be one of your children's friends. I knew our region had a drug problem. I just didn't know to what extent. Erica's death changed that. Her death sort of opened the floodgates of meeting people whose families were also affected. Uh, so many people came into my office talking about their own struggles and their own loss. I heard from a gentleman from Shimokin whose son was so deathly afraid of needles as a young boy that they had to hold him down to get a shot from the doctor. He got addicted to prescription drugs. His mother and father were chasing dealers from their house. The son would go through times where he would get clean, but struggled. The father went armed into the city to find his son. He ultimately lost his son. They found him robbed and dead on the street in Philadelphia. I heard from a man in Danville and a woman from Coal Township. Both had boys struggling with addiction. Both took their own lives. I heard from a young man who had an injury when he was young and ended up addicted to painkillers, then turned to heroin. He has overcome his addiction for today, but admits this day by day. Story after story of good kids who made horrible decisions and the pain the families endured. In the past months, I have talked to many teenagers in our area schools, and we talked about many issues. I would bring up drug and alcohol addiction, and I would ask them, if one of your friends was having issues and you were concerned about them, would you feel comfortable talking to any adult in the school? Not one of them would. They don't want to lose the friendship. I tell them you may have the choice of losing your friendship or losing your friend. You need to save your friend. I realize we won't solve the drug problem here tonight, but if we reach one student or one adult or start one conversation between a parent and a child, this night will have been a success. Erica's death won't just be a statistic. Something good will have came from a senseless death. To the students here tonight, we always say you are our future leaders. We need you to be leaders now. It's up to you what your country will look like, what your state will look like, and what your hometown will look like. You see what our towns are becoming. It's not okay. Don't accept, accept the status quo. It's not cool. You need to make a difference. Stand up for your hometown and say that it's not okay. But to all of you again, uh, this, this, this is in all of our communities. It's, it's in the region. It's everywhere. And there's nothing more important than we can do to, to help save a life and save our children's lives. So I think you're a part of the a solution tonight. And I thank you so much for coming out tonight. That's all the time we have for today's program. I'm State Representative Kurt Mosser. If you have questions about anything you've seen on today's program, feel free to contact me at my local office or through my website. That information will be shown in a moment. Thanks for watching and please join me next time for another edition of Legislative Report.